Open up your Bibles, please, to the book of 2 Peter, chapter 3. 2 Peter, chapter 3. Once you have 2 Peter, chapter 3, go to Revelation, chapter 21. Revelation, chapter 21. Two places, 2 Peter, chapter 3, and Revelation, chapter 21. Now, in these two passages, what you're going to find out is that the day of the Lord also refers to the burning of heaven and earth, which is long after the tribulation. All right? This is long after the tribulation and even after the 1,000 millennial reign of Jesus Christ. All right? Look at right here, 2 Peter chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 10. The Bible says, But the day of the Lord, all right, so we already know what that is, will come as a thief in the night. But look at this. In the which the heaven shall pass away with the great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Well, that's obviously not the tribulation. People are still alive, and God has to judge and set up his earthly kingdom there. But you notice that the earth is burned up and evaporated, gone. Notice, look at Revelation 21. Revelation 21, all right? Revelation chapter 21. All right, we'll look at verse 1. And I saw a new heaven, see that? And a new earth. Why? Because remember 2 Peter 3.10, the first heaven and first earth was burned up. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, see that? And there was no more sea. And when did this happen? This happened two chapters after the tribulation, see? If you look at chapter 20, the tribulation is over. All right, God is setting up 1,000 year millennial reign, all right? And then this happens at chapter 21. And that's what? The day of the Lord. Look at that. See? It's nonsense to insist that day of the Lord is just a tribulation and there's a post-tribulation rapture. Oh, baloney. See? People who say that don't study the Bible, see? They only look at one verse that says day of the Lord. See? That's their problem. They only look at one verse that says day of the Lord and they connect that to a post-tribulation rapture. And that's it. They don't look at all the other verses. They forgot to look at Isaiah where the day of the Lord was connected to the B.C.'s fall of Babylon, and they neglected 2 Peter 3.10 with Revelation 21.1, where the day of the Lord is referred as to the heaven and earth burning up. All right, let's look at another one. Go to Acts chapter 2 now, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. We'll look at verse 20, Acts chapter 2. And we'll look at verse 20. Once you have Acts chapter 2, verse 20, then Matthew 24, all right? Then Matthew 24. Acts chapter 2, verse 20, then Matthew 24. All right, now here's the passage that the post-trippers would jump to, all right? So the day of the Lord will also refer to the tribulation rapture as well, all right? But Acts chapter 2, we'll look at verse 20, all right? Acts chapter 2, verse 20. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon sh into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. You see that? So notice right here, the day of the Lord is connected to sun and moon turning dark, etc. But notice that's connected with Matthew 24. Go to Matthew 24, we'll look at verse 29. Matthew 24, we'll look at verse 29, all right? Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. See that? reflection of that. And notice that what's going to happen. The stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. So this is where the post tribulation will say, here's the day of the Lord, here's the day of the Lord. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. Here's the post tribulation rapture. And they shall de gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. All right. So there's your post-tribulation rapture. Now those who are for the pre-trib are the, also milky people too. They're mostly milky people who are non-denominational non crowds or typical fundamental Baptists. When they believe in uh, a pre-tribulation rapture, they insist there is no post-tribulation rapture. And the milky post-tribbers, they think there is no pre-tribulation rapture, so it's only a post-tribulation rapture. Yep. You see the milkiness. Yep. And the amateur babiness, yep. you see, a lack of Bible knowledge with those guys. The answer is simple. If you look at all the verses, right. 
It's not just pre-trib. It's not just post-trib. It's even the B.C. It's even the tribulation. It's even uh, the burning up of heaven and earth after the 1,000-year millennial reign, after the tribulation, yeah. and it's even the judgment seat of Christ. Yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah. See, they only look at one verse. And a bunch of suckers online see that. They see a verse. That's see right. one verse or a few texts in context. That's it. And they base their whole doctrine off of that. Yeah. And they don't look at the entirety of the scriptures. Amen. You see? You see? All right. Let's look at the book of Jeremiah chapter 22 now. Jeremiah chapter 22. Jeremiah chapter 22. Now, did you notice what the day of the Lord was now? If you go from the B.C.'s Babylon all the way to <laughs> the burning up of heaven and earth, that's more than 4,000 years apart. All right? You see that? What God can do? He can see multiple things going on in the day of the Lord. All right? You can see multiple things going on with the day of the Lord. So remember this. Okay, this is an important term, all right? Another foundation of dispensationalism, which I mentioned before. When you hear a phrase in the Bible, don't think of one thing. God can see two or many different things going on, all right? Like, a, a, again, the example was the coming of Christ, right? The coming of the Messiah. Automatically, Christians, they think two different things. The first coming and the second coming. They all, all Christians think like that. All right? They all, see that's just common sense. Jews they don't think like that because they're non-dispensational. They think only one thing. So when you say the coming of the Messiah, they think, oh, a reigning king. You see? But every Christian, including non-dispensationals, think of two things. You see? They think of a suffering Messiah and a reigning king. All right? Now, the day of the Lord. See, if that's the same, if that's the case with the coming of the Messiah. What do you think about the day of the Lord and many other things in the Bible? You see? To have one mind, it said, is a dangerous basis of false doctrine. Amen. You're no different from a Jew, see? You're no different from a lost Jew who doesn't believe in a Jesus as a Messiah for salvation. That's right. Because you both have that same baby foundation. Non-dispensationalism. All right. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 28. Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 28. All right. So remember... God is going through a physical kingly line now, right? All right, so he did it with David. But notice what he did, all right? There's a problem. Look at verse 28. You see Satan attacking God's seed over and over again from the beginning of Genesis to now, right? So look what the devil did. Look at Jeremiah 22, 28. Is this man Kaniah? All right, he's a king of Israel, all right? A despised broken idol. Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Wherefore are they cast out, he and his seed, and are cast into a land which they know not? O earth, earth, hear the word of the Lord, thus saith the Lord. Write ye this man, look at this, childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed, look at this, the seed is attacked, of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Whoa. Remember what God promised Eve? A seed will come out of you who will reign. And God put that seed through David now, through his kingdom. We saw that. All right? But now it's blocked. Verse 30. We got a problem. We got a problem. So, now look at this one. Go to the book of Matthew, chap uh, Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. We'll look at verse 6. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Now, we're not going to turn to this one. You can write this one down. You can write this one down. Lamentations 5.16. Lamentations 5.16. Basically, that verse is going to show you about the, the kingdom, the physical kingdom of Israel is gone. It's done at the Babylonian captivity. That's why the nation of Israel, ever since the Babylonian captivity until 1948, they lost their physical nation. See, they lost it ever since. All right? Notice that God's physical de king dealing of the kingdom was finished. And then that's why the disciples were looking for it. Look at Acts chapter 1 verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, look at this. They're asking Jesus, Will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? You see that? What are they talking about? They're talking about that ki physical kingdom of Israel that they lost. And they're wondering, when will it be restored again? You see that? So notice that God's physical dealing of the kingdom was finished right here. All right? So it was done. So then the Jews had no physical nation until 1948. 
and will not have a physical kingdom until when? The Messiah. Because if you look at verse 6, notice that it's the Messiah that brings in the physical kingdom again. See, they're asking Jesus if he's the one. Obviously, we know he didn't do that, you know, uh, but we'll cover that later, all right? Let's look at another passage. All right, go to Matthew 1, Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1. So we got a problem here, all right? Now, look at the genius of God. God is a very big genius, all right? Look what he did, all right? Once you have Matthew 1, I want you to go to Luke 3, Luke 3. Matthew 1 and Luke 3. Now, I don't think I'm going to be reading all these verses because it's a lot of uh, names in the genealogy. But you want to write these verses down. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 through 17. Verses 1 through 17. The, uh, Luke chapter 3, 1 is going to be verses 23 through 31. Verses 23 through 31. All right, so Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 through 17, with Luke chapter 3, verse 23 through 31. All right. God is such a great genius, all right? Notice that in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 through 17, it gives Jesus' genealogy from the son of David, all right? But notice that it's through Kaniah. It's through Kaniah, all right? It's through Jeconiah, all right? If you look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 through 17. Remember what God said? He cursed Kaniah. He said that you will not have a Messiah, all right, that will reign in your physical kingdom. But Jesus came from that line from who? Joseph. That's why the virgin birth is important. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus was not born from Joseph. That's right. If you look at Luke chapter 3, verse 23 through 31, all right, Jesus came from Mary, born from Mary. And she was what? From David's son, Nathan. David's son, Nathan. Through that line, Nathan. All right? If you look at that verse, Luke chapter 3, verse 23 to 31. So you see the genius of God, what he did? All right? What God did was this. Is that when he blocked Kaniah's seed and said he will never prosper on the throne. All right? Jesus had to... Okay, so David was promised. See, David was promised an everlasting covenant. See? You're going to have a Messiah that will reign in your kingdom as well. And then notice right here that Kaniah came from David's line, and then God had to block it. But God was so genius that from David's line, he, why not go through Nathan? See, David's son line Nathan, and that from there came through Mary, came the Messiah. See, this is something important. This is what replacement theology and non-dispensationalists overlook. Whenever you see God blocking the Jews or finishing the Jews, he, that's not permanent. That's not done. He can finish up a Jew, but then keep his everlasting covenant with them. You see? People who find verses where God is finished with the Jew here and there and there, they don't, they, they don't look at the other situations where God planned out to keep his everlasting covenant with them. See, baby knowledge again. You see that? They are non-dispensational. So don't mess with God. See, when God, fi God can finish up the Jew right here, but at the same time maintain his everlasting covenant and not contradict himself. You see that right here. See, God is a genius. What you find as contradictions in the Bible it just shows the genius of God, where he has a backup plan and many other things that are a hundred steps ahead of you you never thought of. Well, I'll just make him virgin born. Problem solved. Yep. See? All right, now let's talk about the new covenant. The next covenant is the new covenant, the new covenant. All right, now this is absolutely important. We're going to spend a long time on the New Covenant, all right? This is where we're going to see a lot of things cleared up in doctrine, okay? Now remember, the New Covenant that I told you, okay, the theme is Jew, Gent Jew and Gentile. That's the first stage of the theme. And the second stage of the theme is church, all right? So remember that. Now keep those things in mind, all right? Now, remember, we've seen God primarily dealing with the nation of Israel physically, right? Physical dealings. You know why Christianity became such doctrine that the Jews find it hard to believe? You know why today we go by spiritual, spiritual growth, spiritual foundation, why God deals with us spiritually, not physically, with the nation of Israel? Here it comes now. So we're going to break it down bit by bit with timelines. Let's first cover the timeline of Jesus. The timeline of Jesus. 
I should have brought that chart, but I'll bring it next week. Next week, I'll show you a chart of the new covenant. That way, you can get an idea how God was doing it. All right? But I'll bring it next time. All right, let's cover the time of Jesus, the time of Jesus in the new covenant. All right, let's see how Jew and Gentile was dealt compared with the church. Let's see how physical dealings went along with spiritual dealings here. This will be very important. First of all, go to Luke chapter 1, verse 35. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. Now, why is it that when Jesus came to the scene, he introduced a lot of spiritual doctrine? There's no doubt about that, all right? Primarily, you see him dealing physically still. We're going to look at that. But you notice he introduced some spiritual doctrines. You know why he's able to do that? Because of Luke. Look at here, Luke chapter 1, verse 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost, see that's the Spirit, shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Notice that the Holy Ghost was involved with the birth of Jesus Christ. So because the Holy Ghost was involved in Jesus' conception, Jesus had the authority to give the Holy Spirit. You see that? And he had the authority to, make, to give spiritual dealings. See that? And the authority to make the dead spirit alive. Remember, ever since the timeline of Adam, when he fell? When he fell, the spirit died. And because the spirit died, God cannot primarily base spiritual dealings with them, right? So he had to deal with them physically, right? That's why physical signs and others, physical law of Moses, whatever their physical body did counted as their salvation. But now things are changing because of Jesus Christ. You know why? Because Jesus Christ, uh, the Holy Spirit was involved in that birth. See that? So because of that, J Jesus Christ can have the authority to do the spiritual dealings and give the Holy Spirit. That's why you see a lot of New Testament doctrine forming after that. But it's a lot, a lot more lights will click, all right? Let's keep reading, okay? Look at John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 3. John chapter 3, verse 3. That's why Jesus can preach this. And in the Old Testament, you never saw this preached, all right? You don't see this preached in the Old Testament, clearly. As clearly, you don't see that. John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now look at verse 4. Nicodemus, a Jewish scholar, he should know the book. But notice, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? You know why? He's a physical Jew that dealt primarily with physical things. So he doesn't understand that spiritual birth Jesus is talking about. Born again. Spiritual birth. Because Jesus clarifies it at verse, uh, look at verse uh, John chapter 3 and <coughs> excuse me verse 6 that which is born of the flesh is flesh there's your first birth and that which is born of the notice spirit is spirit that's what he means by born again that's why he can say verse 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life that's why Jesus Christ can introduce that spiritual Christian doctrine uh, faith, see, spiritual, nothing physically that we do, but faith in Jesus Christ, and then through that we get the spiritual birth. All right, now look at John chapter 15. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Look at verse 26. John chapter 15, and we'll look at verse 26. So notice right here that from Jesus' birth, he had the authority to give it, all right? He had the authority to give it. Notice that it will be officially, the Holy Ghost will be officially given after he leaves, after he leaves. John chapter 15, verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send to you from the Father, notice even the Spirit of truth, all right? So it's the Holy Spirit, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. So Jesus said he's going to send him the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, when? Look at chapter 16, verse 7. Chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So notice right here that Jesus said to them that once he leaves, that's when the Holy Spirit will be officially given. Ever since from the fall of man, Adam, they never had that, you see. They never had a dead spirit that can become alive by the Holy Spirit. 
That's why I go to John 4 now. Go to John 4. That's why Jesus, when he was teaching parables, see, when he was giving parables and when he was preaching, a lot of spiritual doctrine was connected. It wasn't as physical. All right? It wasn't as physical. Look at John chapter 4, verse 23. But the hour cometh. And now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Look at that. Light click right here. Verse 23. Jesus says, the hour is now coming. That when people, when they worship God, it's going to be based off of spiritual dealings. See that? That's why verse 24, God is the Spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now Jesus' ministry is going to introduce that. See, that's why he's introducing a lot of spiritual dealings now. That's why we're going to see why physical works and physical Jewish law will no longer be involved. We're going to see that soon. All right? All right, let's look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We'll look at verse 17. Matthew chapter 5. We'll look at verse 17. Once you have Matthew 5, go to John 1. Go to Matthew 5 and John 1. Now, because Jesus fulfilled the law for us, see, we can be under His grace and not go through many strict commandments. That's how important the coming of Jesus was, you see. Jesus Christ, it was, it was necessary, see, for Him to come physically. Why? So that He can do the physical works of the physical law of Moses. And because He did, did that physically for us, we no longer have to do that physically for ourselves through His sacrifice that He attained it for us. Alright, now look at Matthew 5. Matthew 5, verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, notice, but to fulfill. See, Jesus fulfilled the physical works of the law for us. Now look at John 1, 16. John 1, 16. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. See, that's spiritual. Spiritual. We receive the fullness of his grace. Not, verse 17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. You see that? During Moses, see, physical law had to follow the strict commandments. But Jesus changed it at verse 17. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. You see that? So that's why the salvation and a lot of things have changed. All right. Here's another one. Okay, I want you to look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. See a lot of new changes now, right? That's why the coming of Jesus is so important. You see? The coming of Jesus was so important. Look at Matthew chapter 4. We'll look at verse 17. Now remember the Jews, they lost their... Physical kingdom, right? The Jews lost their physical kingdom. So Jesus Christ, when he came down, he introduced to them their physical kingdom once more. Look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All right, so notice right here, Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. All right, meaning it's coming to you. So this is obviously not referring to going to heaven. You see that? This is the mistake many non-dispensationalists make, okay? The kingdom of heaven is not referring to going to heaven, all right? Because notice it says the kingdom is now at hand. You see that? So it's meaning it's like coming for them. It's coming for them. Now how do we know that it's not, uh, it's not referring to heaven? Well, a very easy example is today's example, right? Today's example is that you've heard the Catholics and religion say, we're building, he, he, we're building the kingdom of heaven on earth. You see, they weren't talking about heaven right there. They're talking about building up their own physical kingdom here on earth. Another example is a movie called The Kingdom of Heaven. You've heard of that. But what they meant is conquesting and conquering the kingdom here on earth. You see, not the glories of heaven itself. But not only just common sense of human beings, that phrase, kingdom of heaven, but look at Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. We'll look at verse 12. Matthew chapter 11. We'll look at verse 12. Notice right here that this has to do with a physical kingdom on earth where physical nations fight for. All right? That's why the Catholic Church think they're building the kingdom of heaven. They have to, during the dark ages, they were conquering nations and doing bloodshed. 
All right, but that's a wrong dispensation, which I'll cover later. All right, Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, notice ever since then, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. You see that? So notice it relates to something physical. You see that? It relates to something earthly and physical. Where physical nations, they had to fight for it and die for it, etc., etc. All right? Let's also look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. So now that you know that the kingdom of heaven is an earthly kingdom, look at the differences, okay? This is where people make a mistake. They think that... You've heard of the, the Beatitudes? Have you ever heard the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes? That is not referring to you for your salvation today to go to heaven. This is referring to God's physical kingdom. And it's the rules it's set up that you have to follow to go to his physical kingdom. Okay? Because look at Matthew chapter 5. Uh, well, actually, we won't look at that. If you look at Matthew 5 all the way to 7, from Matthew chapter 5 all the way down to 7, that's where Jesus gives his famous Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. All right? He finishes at chapter 7. All right? At the end of chapter 7, excuse me. But all of those rules, this is important to know, okay? All of that is the Constitution and the salvation plan you'll see. All right? You'll see a lot of ways to get saved and the rules and setup of the Constitution in there. That's why people, you'll find that if you hear them quoting Matthew 5, Matthew 6, or Matthew 7 as your plan of salvation for physical works, you cross that out and mark them out. All right, because this is for the physical kingdom of heaven. I mean, if you looked at uh, verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and then onwards the kingdom of heaven. And not only that, if you look at uh, ch uh, chapter 4, verse 23, before he speaks, he's talking about the gospel of the kingdom. You see that? So everything's going to be about the physical kingdom here. All right? Everything's going to be about the physical kingdom here. All right, let's look at another one. Let's look at Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. Now remember, okay, think, remember this, okay? Jesus Christ, all right, he's preaching about a physical kingdom to physical Jews, but notice that's not all. He's also, remember, he's introducing spiritual things. So you're going to see a spiritual kingdom too, called the kingdom of God. Look at Luke, Luke chapter 17, verse 21. Neither shall they say, Lo, here or lo, there, for behold, the kingdom of God, notice is where? Is within you. So notice that's not a physical kingdom, it's something spiritual. So there's a difference with the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, you got to understand. All right? There's a difference with the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Kingdom of heaven is a physical kingdom. And if you remember your covenants, do you remember the covenants? That's what the Jews were, right? Physical kingdom, physical promises and all that. It relates to all that, you see? Yeah. Not the spiritual side. The spiritual side of the kingdom is called the kingdom of God. Amen. And that's where Christians are going to come in. That's, right. that's why we can say we're working in and we're within the kingdom of God today. But we're not in the kingdom of heaven. You see? Yeah. So this is very important. See, spiritual things are forming now. Now, here's something important, okay? Non-dispensationalists, because they are so amateurish in Bible knowledge, they're going to see kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God interrelated many times, okay? And because they see a lot of interrelation, they assume that it's the same. But number one, you already saw the difference. They're not the same. You saw a physical side and a spiritual side. Right. Kingdom of God is a spiritual side that's different from kingdom of heaven, all right? But here's another dumb, stupid thing that they should have thought of, all right? The, the, the obvious thing they should have thought of is, since Jesus is here introducing physical and spiritual, obviously the kingdom, you're going to see physical side and spiritual side. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> Duh, okay. So then, when you're going to see throughout the Bible, when you read about the kingdom or the kingdom of God, you're going to see physical sides to it too. All right? And then when you read about the, uh, in some of his parables, you'll see that. All right? And then when you read about the kingdom of God, you're going to see actually that cannot be physical, but spiritual. You see? You know why? Because he's here, so they're both here. You see? Yeah. And now let's look at what happened. What you're going to find out later is that that physical kingdom of heaven is eventually gone. They rejected that. So instead, it was the kingdom of God. They had both, see? They rejected one, and it was transferred to the other. But we're going to see that later. All right? We're going to see that later. All right? All right. 
Let's look at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We'll look at verse 31. Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. So this is important. Jesus warned the Jews to start focusing on the spiritual things of the kingdom of God, not just physical anymore. All right? He warned them about that. Because you know why? It would soon be taken from them. It would soon be taken from them and given to another. That's an important note. This is where replacement theology goes bonkers as they say, Oh, the Jews lost the kingdom. But they, see, they don't study the Bible. Amen. All right, now look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Physical. Or what shall we drink? Physical. Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek, physical. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things, physical. Don't focus on physical, but focus on what? Verse 33. But seek ye first, prioritize what? The kingdom of God, spiritual, notice, and his righteousness. See that? That's spiritual. And all these things shall be added unto you. You see that? That's important. Now look at chapter 21. Look at Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21. Matthew 21. We're going to look at verse 43. Matthew chapter 21, verse 43. We haven't even started. More lights are going to click even more and more and more. Amen. This is why this teaching is important, and I stress this so much. And I stress so much about it. I have a strong conviction on this. Because, because you mess up on this, you end up with so much hilarious wrong doctrine out there. Right. So anyone who kicks me, I'm going to kick them back. See? Yeah. And I'm going to name call them eventually. I'm going to name who those heretics are. I don't care if I get unpopular. I'm going to name them who they are. Some Bible believers will be surprised too, but I'm going to name them who they are, warn you about their errors after I finish the covenants. Yeah, it's going to be so important and vital. All right? All right. Let's continue. Chapter 21, verse 43. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. Here's Steve Anderson replacement theology. Oh, the kingdom is taken from the Jews again. Stupid. You know what this is. Yeah. All right? Kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof, the Gentiles. That's why I got the Jews. You see that they're, they're hardly in what? The spiritual kingdom of God anymore, right? No. See that? That's why. See, it was transferring. Jesus warned them. Focus on the spiritual things. Focus on the spiritual things, not just physical. Not just physical. Start to focus on spiritual now. Because it's pretty soon going to be taken from you. All right, let's keep. Let's go to other places. Go to the book of Matt, uh, John, chapter seven. Now, John, chapter seven. John seven. You see, if you don't study the Bible, do you see why these people get messed up so easily in wrong doctrine? Right, yeah. All right, now let's go to John 7. Now, here's the thing, all right? Because Jesus himself was there, all right? Jesus himself was there. He did not die on the cross yet, all right? So here's something that's obvious, all right? It should be obvious. Remember what I told you before throughout the covenants? Because that's why the Jewish sacrifice, the suffering Messiah is so important. Spiritual dealings, all right? Christian salvation is based upon that. A, suffer, a sacrifice of a suffering Messiah with the Holy Spirit given. Now here's something that's vitally important, okay? Because that did not happen yet, obviously Old Testament salvation and Old Testament physical things were still ongoing. You see that? So faith and works by the law were still ongoing. However, here's something else that's important. Because God, the God of salvation himself was down there, right? And because Jesus Christ now is able to introduce spiritual dealings, right? He's able to introduce all kinds of salvations now. All right? We're going to see millennium, tribulation, and the Christian church. You know why? Jesus has the authority to do that. He's God. That's why. Amen. All right. Now look at John chapter 7. All right? John chapter 7. We'll look at verse 38 through 39. John chapter 7. Uh, verse 38 through 39. Notice right here. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So Jesus Christ taught, see, told them about the Christian gospel, getting saved. Now, ignorant, stupid, fundamentalist, and covenant of grace guys, they say, oh, see, since he's preaching about salvation by faith alone, without works, 
that, it, that that's the salvation always. There's no such thing as faith and works. Look at verse 39. It's based on what? But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Remember, it's based on spiritual dealings, on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It did not happen yet, but Jesus was able to introduce it. All right. Go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Look at verse 13. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. Here's the tribulation salvation now. The tribulation salvation. All right? Notice, but he that endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. How many cults you've heard quoting that verse for you to get saved? You know what that is? Look at verse 3. All right? Context. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? That's tribulation. All right? Notice a lot of things are becoming more clear now. You know why? The God of salvation himself was down there. So he knows everything what's going on. He has the authority to introduce all kinds of salvation. Here's another one, all right? Uh, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Matthew chapter 5. We'll look at verse 20. All right, here's... Okay, now I told you before, Matthew 5 is kingdom of heaven, right? Now, think about this. When will, you, when will we ever have a physical kingdom on earth? The millennium. That's the only thing you can think of. So this is the salvation plan then in the millennium, when the physical kingdom comes. This is your salvation plan. Matthew 5, verse 20. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Look at that. Works. Works. See? You have to do all these works. See? But that's for what? The kingdom of heaven. Physical kingdom on earth. When is that going to happen? Millennium. See that? Not only that, let me show you another one. All right? Go to Luke 7. Luke 7. Now, not only are we going to debunk these covenant of grace, salvation the same, or covenant theology campers, we're going to debunk the hyper-dispensationalists now. Go to Luke chapter 7, verse 47. Luke chapter 7, verse 47. All right? Notice he even personally gave salvation by faith. Yeah, he did that. He personally gave salvation by faith. Remember what I told you before? This should not be a panic to you because, number one, the God of salvation himself was down there. Okay, he can do whatever he wants, all right? If he told you to stand on your head to get saved, you stand on your head to get saved, all right? He can do whatever he wants. But the second thing, we saw it before. Remember Lot, Samson, and David? They were exceptions to a general rule, right? They were exceptions to the general rule of faith and works for salvation, but their works have failed them. But those exceptions only prove the rule, remember? Exceptions only prove the rule more. Just because they were exceptions, it only proved the rule more that faith and works was the system of salvation that time. I'm not going to do that again, all right? You can look at my last video on that. I'm not going to expound yeah. on that, all right? But you see... So the hyper dispensationalists, you can make them go bonkers on this. Luke chapter seven, verse forty-seven. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he saith un said unto her, Look at this: Thy sins be, thy sins are forgiven. No animal sacrifices. But I just gave it to her like that. And they that sat at me with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, look at this, thy faith has saved thee, go in peace. Look at that. Look at that. Here's another one. Go to Luke chapter 23. Here's the best one. Luke chapter 23. Luke 23. Here's the best one. He didn't even die yet. He was still breathing. Yet the thief on the cross is one of the greatest stories of a New Testament Christian getting saved. Amen. Luke chapter, Luke chapter 23. We'll look at verse 42, Luke chapter 23, verse 42. All right? And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Now, this is a thief on the cross. His works are utterly wicked. He's a criminal. He can't even do an animal sacrifice. But look at verse 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Look at that. He got saved. Yeah. You see that? Now... Ignorant hyper-dispensationalists who insist that salvation, you know, everything was purely works, 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 and God never even gave a salvation by grace. 
until the Apostle Paul came in and all that kind of stuff. That's nonsense. You see that going on, all right? You see God's grace carried on from the Old Testament and even in the New Testament before Jesus died on the cross. And these covenant of, gra uh, covenant of grace, this Calvinist covenant theology camp, they, they point out these verses, see, which is only a handful compared to the work salvation, which is more numerable. So the hybrid dispensationalists have better evidence. So then just a handful of people where they see their works failing them, and then God's grace is what saved them, they overlook the fact, what are you going to do with the... the the 80% to 70% all the other verses where this, they say you have to do this work and this work and this work and this work for your salvation. You see? You know what the two camps are? Baby Christians. You see that? Amen. They only know a handful of verses. And you get messed up with this kind of wrong doctrine. That's right. See? Wrong doctrine. I stress that over and over again. It's so important. You see? You have to be familiar. See, people who teach false doctrine don't know the covenants. See, yeah, they don't right. have an idea of what's going on. They don't. They don't. You're absolutely right. They just find a handful of verses and they assume that's what's going on. You have, do you have the full... What we're doing is going from a full familiarity, familiarity with everything in the Bible. That's, right. that's how you know the covenant. Not one verse or a couple. Yeah. Oh, I know the covenant after that! Isaiah chapter 61. Now, verses 1 through 3, we read this before. I'm not going to read it to you again. All right? We read this last week. Remember, when the Bible talked about the coming of Christ, remember? Keep it a highlight. It's, pos it's very highly possible God can see many things going on, right? That God can dispensationalize it, right? All right, that's important. So, now, the coming of Christ in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 through 3, is two comings of Christ. We saw that before last time. Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5, we'll look at verse 2. Now remember, I told you before, during the Old Testament, the prophets preached a lot about the coming of Christ, day of the Lord, etc., and etc. Alright, I told you about that. Now the important thing is this, is that the Jews, see, because they were not dispensational, they only had a one-minded set. They got to realize this. Jesus fulfilled part of the coming of Christ by his earthly ministry. But because the Jews failed to dispensationalize, they couldn't see the truth of Jesus being the Messiah that the prophets had told them long ago. You see? Because they were only looking at the, the earthly reign, not his physical life on earth where he was a suffering Messiah. They didn't see that part. Look at Micah chapter 5, verse 2 through 4. So the, the Jews got to look at this. But thou, Bethlehem, and Frater, that thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth hath been from a bowl, from everlasting. And notice right here that in verse uh, 3, Therefore will he give them up until the time that which she travaileth hath brought forth, and the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. And he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide, for now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. You know what Jesus fulfilled? Just like Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, only half of it. Same thing right here, half of it. Verse 2, he only fulfilled the, the half of verse 2. The next part, ruler in Israel, going forth, been from all everlasting. Verse 3, you know, return the remnant of Israel. Verse 4, he reigns on the earth, did not happen yet. All right, here's another one. Go to Zechariah 9. Zechariah 9. Zechariah 9. You have to dispensationalize, see? If you don't dispensationalize, then you shouldn't be a Christian. You should be a Jew then. You should be a Jew. Why are you being a Christian? See? You should be a Jew then if you don't dispensationalize. Because you, non-dispensationalists, believe you have to dispensationalize this passage. You believe that Jesus Christ fulfilled part of that, but didn't fulfill the rest. Right. That's the same thing with the day of the Lord, the coming of Christ, and other things you see in the scriptures. Okay, you see part of it fulfilled, but other things not fulfilled yet. Okay, you have to dispensationalize. Alright, let's look at Zechariah 9, verse 9. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just in having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. All right, Jesus fulfilled that, right? But notice verse 10, he did not fulfill it. 
You notice verse 11, he did not fulfill it. Verse 12, he did not fulfill it. Verse 13, he did not fulfill it. See, he did not conquer the nations and then uh, armed up and armed up Israel and saved the nation of Israel and returned them. See, they did not become a nation yet. All right. Now, look at Acts chapter 2 now. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Now, notice right here, okay, when Jesus talked about the coming of Christ and the day of the Lord. Keep this in mind. Remember, remember, do you, do you admit you have to dispensationalize, right? Coming Amen. of Christ and day of the Lord. You saw that? Amen. Look at this now, okay? This is where post tribbers mess up in, okay? Now, and the Jews mess up in too, all right? When the Bible talks about the coming of Christ and day of the Lord, when Jesus was there, it was to physical Jews in the tribulation, ready for the tribulation rapture and the messianic king. That's what the coming of Christ referred to and the day of the Lord. But you're going to see a different one when Paul came in with the church. And you're going to see day of the Lord and coming of Christ referring to things to the Christian. That's not tribulation. Uh, but we'll come to that later. See? You... All right, now let's look at this. Acts chapter 2, verse 20. Uh, we read that verse already. All right. Uh, so you know what? We won't. We won't read it again, all right? Go to Matthew 24, though, okay? There's something I think I have overlooked in Matthew 24. So Acts 2.20, we read that before. Sun, dark, moon to blood. Uh, before that great and notable day of the Lord, all right? And context of the day of the Lord is uh, verses 15 through 21. Verses 15 through 21, all right? Notice right here. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in, notice what? The holy place. So this is Jewish then. See, the temple in Jerusalem. This is not Christian. All right. Notice verse 16, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. That's Jewish, not Christian. Uh, that's why verse 21, it says, there shall be great tribulation. See that? Tribulation. Jewish. See? Nothing, nothing spiritual for a church or a Christian, you see. It's physical dealings, physical Jews, all right? If you also notice uh, verse 20, don't go out on the Sabbath day. See that? Jewish, all right? Let's, now, if you look at verse 29 through 31, which we read before, there it is, the, the post-tribulation rapture. See that? Post-tribulation rapture. There it is right there. You know what that was? That was to physical Jews in the tribulation, ready for the tribulation rapture and messianic king. See? They're looking for that king coming. Look at chapter 25. Chapter 25, verse 31. Chapter 25, verse 31. You see? Those replacement theology and Steve Anderson, those guys who don't know Bible, they all focus spiritual, spiritual, spiritual. Yeah. What do they do about the 30-something books that are physical, 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 Jewish, Jewish, Jewish? They completely throw that in the garbage and forget that. That's why their post-tribulation doctrine, they got to realize this, a lot of it was dealing toward Jews physically. Amen. Kingdom. Because God promised to do that with them. Uh, go to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. Alright, we'll look at verse 31. Verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and the, all the holy angels with Him, post-tribulation rapture, post-tribulation rapture, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. See, the kingdom, physical kingdom. And you are already familiar with the Davidic covenant, right? Amen. You're familiar with the Old Testament, all those gazillion verses I showed you, right? That's what the Jews were waiting and expecting for. That's right. You see? Uh, verse 32, And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. Mm -hmm. You see that right here? He's reigning over the world. Amen. You see that? There it is, okay? There it is. That's what the Jews are looking for. You see that today? Mm -hmm. That's what the Jews are looking for. The Jews are waiting for their physical king, physical kingdom, physical Messiah. That's what the, their Old Testament about the day of the Lord and the coming of Christ was talking about. You see? And then the stupid replacement theology guys, they say, Oh, no, 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 the Jews don't understand. It's all spiritual, it's all spiritual. You see? Those dumb buckets, they got to realize this. There's spiritual dealings and physical dealings yeah. going on here. All right? 
That's why the Jew cannot understand the Christian spiritual doctrine, right? And that's why the stupid replacement theology guys, they don't understand the physical Jewish doctrine in the Bible. You study the whole Bible. Amen. All right? Not just portions. That's right. All right, we're going to see more. This is going to be amazing. We're going to see a lot more. All right? Hello, this is Pastor Gene Kim of San Jose Bible Baptist Church. Have you ever asked this question that if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you can go to heaven? My friend, it's so simple to get saved. You first got to realize that you can't go to heaven because you've sinned against God. And God, as a holy judge, he has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you feel sorry over your sinful condition. And if you do, there is hope for you. You see, Jesus, who is God, left heaven, came down here on earth, died on the cross, raised himself from the dead. Why did he do all that? So his blood can wash away the sins for you. So you see, that's your only way to heaven of what he did on the cross and not what you do in cleaning up all your sins and going to church, getting baptized, or doing any sort of good work. It's faith alone in what Jesus did on the cross. If you can do that, then all you have to do is say that to God. You might say, well, I don't know how to say it. Can you help me out? Sure, you can say it this way. Dear God, I am sorry for being a sinner. I believe Jesus is God who died and resurrected so his blood can wash away my sins. I trust in that alone and not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend. If someone were to ask you, how did you get saved? It's very simple, right? What did you do? I just put my faith on what Jesus did on the cross. That's it. My friend, congratulations on your salvation. Right now, because Satan can't damn you to hell, what he's going to try to do now is try to ruin your life. And he did a very good job in this world. That's why it's so hard to find truth, and there are so many lies with a gazillion different churches, different Bibles, different beliefs, different religions. So my friend, it is so important to grow in truth and get involved in a Bible-believing work that can save you from a lot of trouble. There are four things we recommend for you to do, which is found in the resources link below. Number one, get involved in a Bible-believing church near you. Number two, Study the King James Bible issue and have only that kind of Bible, no other modern version Bible. Number three, study dispensationalism so you can find the right doctrine and truth. Number four, study only under Bible-believing teachers. My friend, this is all explained further in the resources link below, so please click on it and get to work in a Bible-believing work because you only have one light to live for him and you don't want to waste it away by the devil. And I'll be inside that great palace and the smoke will be so thick. I'll drop to my knees and I'll drop to my face like those Navy SEALs do. And I'll start crawling. I'll start crawling. And I'll look down that uh, ivory aisle there and I'll see a, a throne. And I'll see some feet that got holes in them and they got jewel sandals on. Then I'll pull myself up to those feet and I'll cry on those feet like that woman that cried on his feet and wiped the tears with her hair. Hey, glory to God, you're going to let him do the shining. You're going to say, oh God, thank you. Hallelujah. And the angels will worship and the cherubim will worship and the seraphim will worship and thank God an independent Baptist will worship. Another song said, Once I was straying in sin's dark valley, no hope within could I see. They searched through heaven and found a Savior to save a poor soul like me. Glory to God. He stood out there in my Solomon and he's go, Ho, 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 Jesus saves. <laughs> the Bible saves for God's And he's preaching, and, and the people that's ringing the bell, there we go. And he'd stand up, and, uh, and people walk up and they said, Wow, Santa Claus preaching. What? Then you enter the throne of glory. Yeah. Oh, the Father opens up his arms. Come on, there's a banner raised above the skies. Of all the angels, you go to the Jesus Christ, it's not through Muhammad, 
He did not do anything for you. It's not through Buddha. It's not through the commandments. It's only through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm good. I'm just going to stay still and I'll just study at home. Uh, uh, I, watch, I watch preaching on the TV. Uh, yeah, you can turn the preacher off. You can yeah. turn me off. like his skin turning to gold or something. They don't know what's going on. He's about two more steps. Here's that crowd. Hi, how you doing? Hey, Mom. Hi, Dad. Hey, see, hey, see what's that? Way down there at the edge of that street, there's the Lord of Fair and Glory. And down he comes off that throne. He always would come down for a sinner. <laughs> and he comes down there. Well done, my good and faithful servant of the joy of our Lord. Now, old boy's heart going down there, it says, Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Then he laid down on that table, and Dr. Grace got out the scalpel, and he removed that old cold stony heart out of my friend. Oh, he threw it in the trash can, and he put a brand new heart into my friend's chest. And when he when he woke up, uh, he looked around and he said, "Oh my." Everything has been changed. Everything looks different. Oh, I'm so happy now that I had uh, the heart operation. Hey, praise God, there's no other savior like our heart. Oh, better.